Um, yeah, you have to make peace with Russia in the end. I mean, you may not, you don't have to like them. You can hate them, but you just have to be realistic and understand that it's in your interest to, to get along with Russia. Now, you know, there always have been tensions between Ukraine and Poland. You know, first there is um, a lot of the tensions are over the history between them and the, the role of the Banderites in, um, you know, what's now Western Ukraine and used to be part of Poland, where the, the Banderites, you know, the followers of Stefan Bandera killed many, many Poles. I think we're talking about hundreds of thousands, something like 200,000. Um, Can you explain and, a little bit? I know we've done this before, yeah. a little bit about the Banderites, because it's amazing how little people know about the history of Ukraine. <laughs> And, yeah. and why there is this neo-Nazi element in Ukraine and where there's this real division in Ukraine, why we had a civil war in Ukraine, the uh -huh. split between the East and the West. Right. Okay, well, I, you know, I'm not going to go into depth, nor really could I, but I'll just sketch it out. Uh, Stefan Bandera was a, a nationalist leader, um, a Ukrainian who rose to power, you know, during the 1930s and, and made an alliance with... Um, um, with uh, Nazi Germany. And when the Germans invaded, um, uh, well, first, yeah, when they invaded first Poland, taking it back from the Soviets and then, and then Ukraine, um, he actually was, I mean, it was more than an informal alliance. I think they were, you know, they, they established a formal alliance, worked in coordination with, uh, with uh, Nazi units and uh, were responsible for killing uh, great numbers of civilians. Um, you know, I've just mentioned that the 200, 1,000 or so Poles, but Russians, Jews, and then uh, and other, and, and various leftists and so forth. Um, so, you know, by any, if the, if we apply, you know, the uh, the general condemnation of, of uh, th that we now apply to the Nazis and to Nazi collaborators, Stefan Bandera should be, um, you know, consigned to the deepest circle of hell. And uh, but he has been he is considered a hero within much of Ukraine It's certainly not all of Ukraine, but in much of Ukraine, especially Western Ukraine. And there are statues to him. There are busts to him. Um, <clears throat> many of the prominent leaders um you know of the kiev government our followers our admirers of stefan bandera uh it used to be well solution of course was the head of the armed forces and until he was pushed out not too long ago um he's now ambassador to uk but if he's got not just one but two busts of stefan bandera in his office and you could see him you know in some of the interviews and it's just amazing that Again, it's that, that that Western Europe and the U.S. decided just not to talk about this. Not uh, this was something that was brought up, you know, be, uh, before twenty twenty two. Occasionally, it was brought up. In fact, there was a, 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 a law passed by Congress, you know, that uh, uh, denied aid to the what was then called the Azov Battalion um, because of their their association with Bandero and with uh, you know with uh, Nazism in, in general. Um, and then it, it was all forgotten and now you're not allowed to bring it up. If you bring it up, you know, you're obviously repeating Putin talking points, but it's real and, and it's there, you know, if they're, if you go back, I think like 10, you know, the, the devotion to Stefan Bandera is something that's, that's always been there. I think that survived even the Soviet years, you know, obviously it was hidden during that time. There were efforts, uh, during the first, uh, decade or so after the end of world war two, to actually um, foment rebellion. It, um, these efforts were carried out by CIA, the CIA and Western intelligence agencies to carry out, you know, to foment rebellion in Ukraine using the followers of Stefan Bandera. And they went nowhere, but there was, the, the, this, it went well into the 50s. Um, you know, the, the supplies would be, and personnel would be parachuted in and, and the, the Soviets clamped down on it, but it was, it was there and, and it's, came back to life after the fall of the Soviet Union. And when Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, it was still, it was a very small minority. I think the great majority of Ukrainian citizens, including those in the West, looked askance at them. But they have um, grown in power and influence over time. They've, they've seized the leasing institutions. So their ideas, like on their, their anti-Russian 
um, hatred has become institutionalized. So now, like just the other day, I saw that uh, um, a town in Western Ukraine was going to hire a Russian language inspector, basically a monitor, somebody to go around if, to make sure nobody's speaking Russian. You know, that's, that's the kind so of creepy. Yeah, right. That's but, that's you know, crazy. long before we got to that point, there were efforts to ban the Russian language. It even preceded 2014. And it was because of the influence of these people, you know, the extreme nationalists associated with Stefan Bandera. And they began putting up statues to him. And then, you know, when they had the elections, um, it's true. People will point out, well, they only got two percent of the vote. But the problem is it's it as a highly organized and high, heavily armed two percent so they ended up having an outsized influence on the government which you can see to this day and they really have taken over much of the government so, so there are top leaders that are clearly band of rights and their ideology is now um is has become the ideology of the regime now poland is always up for obvious reasons you know though poland has been a, a fervid supporter of of Ukraine throughout this conflict, you know, since certainly since uh, 2022, um, they haven't forgotten, you know, what happened to them. They haven't forgotten their history. And recently, the the former foreign minister, Kalebra, uh, you know, of Ukraine had made some comments about, you know, well, he, he, I, I can't remember the details, but he, he brought this up again in a way that greatly displeased the Poles. You know, there was no apology, but actually a celebration, again, of Bandera and his people. And the Poles demanded an apology. So there, there is this, this, these sore points between the Poles and the Ukrainians, you know, over the, the history, which the Poles will not forget. And then also, you know, there are so many Ukrainian refugees poured into Poland. And, I, and my understanding that has actually created quite a bit of friction. And now they're not, not so welcome. And then uh, I think there would, you know, there always has been, uh, let's say, an anti, anti intervention, anti war wing of, uh, of, you know, Polish politics. It never went away. Um, but, you know, hopefully what we saw there is a sign that they're growing in strength and gaining popular support. That would, that would be in line with what we're seeing in like in the rest of Western Europe, like what, what happened in Germany, where clearly the, the anti war, uh, vote was very strong to the point that Olaf Scholz, I think, is changing his tunes because he, cause he realized that what he's doing is very unpopular. You know, Poland may not be as far as Germany, but uh, there's reasons to hope that they're going down the same trajectory towards a more, you know, a, um, anti-war, anti-interventionist position.